Well, welcome to the Taylor Report, CIUT 89.5 FM. I'm Phil Taylor, your host. We're very fortunate today. We're going to be speaking to Zafar Bengesh, and he is with Crescent.ICIT hyphen digital dot org, but just go Crescent, you will find Zafar Bengesh. Uh, Zafar is quite well known to our listeners and one of the most knowledgeable people on matters to do with uh, Islam in the Middle East. And boy, do we have a lot of questions. Zafar, welcome to the program. Thank you very much, Phil. And nice to see you after such a long time. I hope you are keeping well. And same to you. And uh, this is, that's going to have to be part of our discussion is COVID-19 and its impact on uh, all these events that we're going to be talking about and even the health of our communities, which uh, I have to say in North America, we don't seem to have the same social structure that exists in other places which, where there seems to be more uh, regard for science and, uh, and for protecting the population. Um, I, have, I better ask you, right? I think a rather urgent question, and I know that this has to be on your mind. Uh, in Bahrain, there are a number of people uh, who are scheduled to be executed at any moment. As a matter of fact, for all I know, they have been. Uh, I, I've seen calls going out from various places. Can you remind us what is going? What has happened in Bahrain? It's uh, for all the talk from the State Department and elsewhere about human rights. I don't. We don't hear about Bahrain. Can you tell us about that? Yes. Uh the, the people of Bahrain are uh, absolutely fed up of the ruling family that is uh, a minority, a tiny minority. Um, although I don't wish to sort of look at this uh, purely from a sectarian perspective, but we cannot avoid going to that issue because more than 90% of the population in Bahrain is Shia. And the ruling family uh, is Sunni, and they have been in power, kept in power by the Americans, the Saudis, and so on. And naturally, when the people of Bahrain uh, demand their fundamental rights, which is human rights, human dignity, the right to vote, uh, the regime unleashes its reign of terror. And so these um, death sentences, etc., that they have uh, imposed on these people are primarily because the people are uh, demanding their fundamental rights. Of course, Bahrain is, uh, as I'm sure your uh, listeners would know, there is the uh, US naval base in Bahrain. And so the Americans obviously want to keep it that way. And if let's say this particular family uh, were to lose control, then the people would demand that this American uh, the fifth fleet, the American fifth fleet is basically based over there. And from there, the Americans launched their wars of aggression against other countries uh, in, in the region. And so that is really why the Americans are uh, supporting the Bahraini regime. And that's also why the, the Saudis are supporting this regime. But it's essentially the fundamental rights of the people of Bahrain that demand that they should be given those rights so that they can choose and decide for themselves uh, what kind of a government they want in the country. You know, it, it strikes me as a little, it, it's a leftover from a, a, a sort of false dawn story that when the U.S. was interested in regime change a few years back, and it was the time of Obama, in that region, they, they, they had this expression, the Arab Spring. And unfortunately for the mass of the population of Bahrain, they joined in and asked for their rights. And their demonstrations, my memory was they were peaceful demonstrations. Uh, and then they were crushed. Yes, uh, in fact, uh, throughout uh, these years of the Bahraini people's demands, they have been extremely peaceful. They have never, ever talked or uh, taken up any arms or any, they have never resor resorted to any violence. They have been completely peaceful. They have, uh, you know, whenever, the, for instance, the military has come and demanded that these people disperse, they have. But unfortunately, the regime is... Uh, 
so uh, insecure uh, because it knows that it's a, it's a minority regime. The overwhelming majority of the people do not support it. And um, the, the Bahraini people and their leadership have never resorted to violence as was witnessed in some other countries. But uh, even with that kind of a, a totally nonviolent, peaceful uh, demand for their rights, uh, they have been ruthlessly suppressed. Uh, you know, uh, literally uh, hundreds of people have been uh, thrown in jail. In fact, initially when, they, um, when the Bahraini people uh, made the, the demand uh, during the so-called Arab Spring, uh, some of the people that were shot by the police and the military, uh, when they ended up in hospital, uh, the military then went into the hospitals and dragged these people from their hospital beds even though they were wounded, just dragged them out and took them and throw, threw them in jail. So they, they, the violence has actually been entirely perpetrated by the regime and its forces, and the demonstrators have been completely peaceful. Yeah. Uh, we're speaking to Zafar Bengash. He is the director of the Institute of Contemporary Islamic Thought and on the editorial board of Crescent International. Uh, Canada has relations with Bahrain, doesn't it? Friendly relations? Oh, absolutely. Yes, yes. Canada has friendly relations. Well, I have to ask you, I thought we put sanctions on people who executed children. Yes, I know. But that, you see, this is where, the, this is where the, the, this is where the problem arises that, you know, um, uh, when it's, uh, it's um, our own friends and allies, then, then you know, we just uh, overlook those things. So you can see that, um, you know, Saudi Arabia which is the patron saint of Bahrain together with the United States, also has this atrocious record of executing people publicly. They behead them publicly. And it's a spectacle that they, they you know, want, to, want the rest of the people to see, to terrorize them. And yet, despite demands from a very large number of people in Canada, Canadian citizens, that Canada should not be selling weapons to Saudi Arabia, yet our government continues to sell them weapons. $15 billion worth of, you know, that was a contract that was signed during uh, Harper's time. And of course, the liberals at that time were saying that, well, this was a contract that another government had signed. But now that they are, the liberals are in power, they have an opportunity to cancel that contract. They refuse to do so. In fact, the Canadian government, after a while, last year, you know, it suspended the delivery of weapons for a while, but then this year, um, the, the Canadian government resumed a supply of weapons. And these are, of course, um, light armored personnel carriers that are manufactured in London, Ontario. And there have been protests even outside that manufacturing plant. Uh, Canadians have gone there uh, asking that this plant be shut down and that you know Canada should not be supplying uh, weapons that are being used against the Saudi people, incidentally, in the eastern part of Saudi Arabia, the Saudi Arabia regime has used these weapons, although the contract specifically says that Saudi Arabia is not permitted to use these weapons against uh, civilian population. And the Saudi regime has also used these weapons against the people of Yemen that the Saudis have been waging a war against since March of 2015. And uh, hundreds of thousands of people have been killed in Yemen. Uh, about more than a million children in Yemen are uh, suffering from cholera. Uh, in fact, uh, about uh, a week or 10 days ago, in fact, on July the 10th, uh, the World Food Program director for Yemen said that 10 million people in Yemen are on the verge of starvation. And that 22 million of Yemen's 24 million people are food deficient. So there is a desperate need for um, food and other desperately needed supplies to the people of Yemen. And yet here we have a situation whereby our own government in Ottawa is supplying the Saudis these terrible weapons that the Saudis are using against the Yemeni people. We're speaking to Zafa Bengash. Uh, and Zafa is the... We get this right, director of the Institute of Contemporary Islamic Thought, editorial board of Crescent. Um, Zephyr, uh, we have a, a really important issue that 
in my mind, the, the media here is not covering uh, at all well, and that is this issue that has flared up between uh, the People's Republic of China and the government of India. The two armies actually had a physical encounter. They didn't use weapons. Apparently, they were fighting along at a border point. And I just have the feeling that this is not <laughs> being contextualized here. What is, what is this all about? There are uh, several dimensions to this story. And of course, we need to be uh, aware of the, the, the history as well. But let me summarize it as follows. Uh, of course, this whole issue is being, at least in, in, in the Western world, it's being looked at only in the context of um, the US and the Western world's policy to box in China. Uh, because China is uh, a rapidly emerging economic superpower as well as a military power. That's why we see these American provocations in the South China Sea um, and this uh, quad arrangement whereby Japan, the US, Australia, and India uh, um, want to hold military exercises to challenge China's presence over there. Um, and what India has done, and of course there has been a long history to this, uh, but what India did was that in an area uh, where there is uh, an undemarcated border between the two countries' forces, um, and that undemarcated border is referred to as the line of actual control. Mm -hmm. And this line of actual control came into existence in uh, October, November of 1962, when India and China had a war. And that war also emerged because of India's provocative actions at that time. But let me place it in the sort of context of exactly why this recent clash occurred between Indian and Chinese forces. And as you rightly pointed out, uh, no weapons were used, or at least no firearms were, were used because they had agreed uh, previously that they would not use firearms in, when they, if there are any clashes. But this time, basically, clubs were used and stones and things like that. But this is a very, very rough terrain. There are mountainous peaks, um, very dangerous mountain ridges, etc. And apparently what took place was that um, the Indians uh, had done several things that really alarmed the Chinese. So let me, you know, walk your listeners through this. Number one, back in 2008, the Indians um, opened or reopened a, an Air Force base right up, uh, right at the top, about maybe eight, uh, nine kilometers from the line of actual control. And that uh, Air Force base had been evacuated by the Indians in the war uh, with China in 1962. And that Air Force Base is referred to as Dalat Beg Oldie Air Force Base. And this Air Force Base is only about 10 kilometers from the Karakoram Pass that links China with Ladakh region. So number one, it is only nine, eight, nine kilometers from the line of actual control. And then it is only 10 kilometers from the Karakoram Pass. That is the pass that the Chinese are able to come into the Ladakh region, which is, of course, a Buddhist region. And what the Indians did was that not only did they reoccupy that military base in 2008, but the Indian Air Force upgraded the runway to such an extent that now heavy military transport planes can also land at that base. That was the first provocative act by, by India. Of, of course, the Chinese protested about this, but the Indians just ignored it. Secondly, for nearly 20 years now, the Indians have been building a, an all-weather uh, road that goes from the south all the way to this Air Force base. This 255 kilometers long road, which, is, which has basically reduced the travel time for Indian forces from the south to the north from two days to only six hours. And again, the Chinese protested about this road because the unwritten agreement between the two countries was that they will keep their forces 20 kilometers away 
from the line of actual control. Whereas this highway runs right next to the line of control, the line of actual control. More worrying than that for the Chinese was that the, the Indians started to build feeder roads from this highway. That means that if there is a clash, that they can immediately mobilize forces, get them to the highway and get them to the points that the Indians need them to be. Now, we need to look at this in the context of what India did last year. On August the 5th of 2019, India unilaterally abrogated the autonomous status of the, the state of Jammu and Kashmir that is under Indian control. Then in the Indian parliament, uh, Indian ministers started to make uh, announcements that they are going to take Aksai Chin as well. Now, Aksai Chin is a region which is under Chinese control and it's, of course, Buddhist region. But it is crucial for China because there is a major highway. It's called the NH219 that links the Chinese province of Xinjiang with Tibet. Now, the, the Indians were now so close to Aksai Chin along the line of control, uh, actual control and this highway that the Chinese became alarmed in the sense that Indian military moves in, in Ladakh region, number one. Secondly, uh, abrogating the uh, autonomous status of Jammu and Kashmir as well as of Ladakh and Ladakh as well as Jammu and Kashmir were then taken under India's direct control. They are now being run directly from Delhi. And then Indian threats that they are going to take Aksai Chin as well from China. And then, of course, we know that India maintains this uh, Tibet government in exile in India, whereas Tibet is under Indian control. So uh, you add all of these things. The Chinese said, these Indians are not listening to us. They're getting, you know, very uppity. And of course, the Indians thought that because they have this um, strategic military, strategic agreement with, with uh, the U.S., uh, that now that the U.S. is backing them, that they can take on China. And so the Chinese decided to teach the Indians a lesson which they did on June the 15th and 16th, and they clubbed about 20 Indian soldiers to death, uh, including the colonel who was in charge of Indian forces, Colonel Santosh Babu, uh, as well as uh, another officer that was with the, the colonel, uh, a major, and 18 other Indian soldiers were, were killed. Uh, and the, the, Indi the Chinese also captured about 10 Indian soldiers. Again, that included one colonel, three majors, and then other soldiers, but the Chinese then released them and let them go. But the latest situation that we have is that both countries have agreed to de-escalate and uh, move their forces back, uh, but, but the Indians, of course, continue to act in a provocative manner uh, because they think that just because they have um, uh, the Americans uh, at their back, that the Americans are backing them, that they can somehow take on China. I believe they're making a big mistake because um, uh, the Chinese know how to defend their interests. Uh, although it is true that the Chinese do not want conflict in that region because this major um, highway, which is referred to as CPEC, China-Pakistan Economic Corridor, it, it runs a, a little bit further uh, through Pakistani Kashmir, and this goes all the way up to the south or the southern uh, Naval, naval port at Gawadar, which is at the southern tip of Pakistan. But this uh, major highway that runs through Pakistan is a linchpin of China's Belt and Road Initiative, which basically would link China to Central Asia and onwards to uh, Europe. And all of these countries and uh, economies would be linked with China's economic grid. And I, I think it's important for your um, listeners to know that the Belt and Economic uh, and, and Road Initiative of China is a multi-trillion dollars project. That China will invest trillions of dollars in all of these regions, building roads and bridges and railway lines so that trade could uh, be encouraged and that these economies would act collaboratively rather than um, in, in a conflict situation and regrettably, India is acting as a spoiler on behalf of the United States. And that is the reason why we have this conflict in that region, which of course has de-escalated, but my fears are that perhaps uh, this may not necessarily last too long because the Americans want 
uh, to provoke China or to encircle China. And unfortunately, the Indians are playing that dirty game uh, on behalf of the Americans. Yeah. Speaking to Zafar Bengash of uh, Crescent. Um, you know, Zafar, I'm really glad you reminded us that because there's a pattern, it was a disturbing one. I, I'm old enough, as the expression goes, to remember that it was uh, Nehru, and I believe his foreign minister was a man named Krishnan Menon. Krishnan Menon. And uh, people thought of him as anti colonialist, uh, anti imperialist, and uh, part of the struggle to uh, end colonialism and, re and really develop the previously colonialized world, and it was shocked when Nehru made an alliance basically with the British and Americans. Am I right? Absolutely. In fact, um, you know, in uh, the Chinese had been reaching out to the Indians, to Nehru and others, uh, and when he was the prime minister, uh, that uh, we should have, um, you know, friendly relations. And yet um, the Indians, uh, and it was Nehru, as you rightly pointed out, he had adopted what is referred to as the forward policy, which is a very aggressive policy, which essentially wanted to confront China and to browbeat it into submission because uh, Nehru had made a pact or deal with the British as well as the Americans. And um, of course, uh, you know, when, when the war erupted, again, it was as a result of uh, Indian provocations uh, at that time, uh, you know, the Chinese did not want war, uh, but there's a famous quotation uh, from um, Mao Zedong, who was the Chinese leader at the time, uh, that, uh, you know, when the Indians were continuously provoking the Chinese, Mao Zedong said that, um, you know, um, uh, it, it would be um, impolite of us if, it, if the Indians continue to raise their head that we don't respond. So he said that I think we ought to respond and we ought to sort of, you know, take this matter into our own hands because they, the Indians continue to be um, provoking, uh, provoking us militarily. And I want to point out that when, when the war broke out, uh, Nehru immediately uh, appealed to the United States. And of course, Kennedy was the president at the time. And um, uh, Kennedy had a, had a meeting over there and, and the, 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 the Americans immediately dispatched uh, fighter planes to, to India to support India against China. So here you have a situation whereby Nehru was constantly trying to project to the world that he's a leader of the non-aligned movement, that he's not aligned with any superpower, and yet he was appealing to the Americans and um, mm -hmm. uh, you know doing, uh, doing all of these deals with them. And of course, uh, Kennedy wanted to do more and to send more um, supplies, but they, they uh, U.S. Defense Secretary at the time, uh, McNamara, uh, suggested that uh, what we should do, what the United States should do, is to first of all study the situation and see what is the reality rather than just plunging into it. That we don't want to plunge into a situation that we may not be able to get out of because we will end up at war with, with uh, China. And so uh, Kennedy decided to send um, his roving ambassador, Everell Harriman, and he, he was very much went to um, India, but by then the Chinese had already declared a ceasefire. This this war in 1962 lasted for about a month, and whatever territory the Chinese wanted, they took they uh, took possession of that, and then the Chinese unilaterally withdrew from the rest of the territory. They didn't want that territory, and they even released all of the Indian soldiers they had captured. Probably they thought that, you know, feeding them uh, dal and rice all every day was probably a little bit too much because there were so many Indian soldiers that they had captured. They said, just go, just get lost, you know. They gave them their shoes and their uniforms and sent them home. Yeah. And yeah. after that, there were discussions between India and China. And the two countries agreed that, number one, they will keep their armed forces 20 kilometers away from what is referred to as the line of actual control. And number two, that if there are clashes between them, that they are not going to use firearms so that they could they would uh, avoid uh, casualties. And this was the situation that emerged uh, in in June of this year or May, but then in June, and, and the Indians continued to be packed provocatively. And so that is why we had this uh, casualties uh, that, that 
the Indians suffered as a consequence. By the way, that really points up, uh, the, you notice the propaganda around this crisis, and I'm really glad you gave us such a, a clear account, is that the Western media wanted a body count. They wanted to have casualties. They wanted to tell, so that they could get, frankly, the blood flowing. I, I, that's my impression. And the Chinese refused to talk about that. Said, yes, of course. The Chinese would not, not talk about it. Yeah, the Chinese refused to indulge in those things and they, they sort of did not take the bait. Um, what they simply said was that they, they would like to de-escalate and they repeatedly called upon the Indians to de-escalate. They have no intention of continuing this conflict. They, they want uh, you know, the, the situation to, to return to normalcy. Uh, as it was before uh, these, these latest clashes uh, erupted. Because you see, China's policy has been to not provoke military conflict unless they are provoked in, into a situation where it becomes absolutely intolerable for them not to engage in, in conflict. Because China's plan has always been that it is better to engage other countries in uh, economic development. In fact, they've even offered to India. Repeatedly, the Chinese have offered to India to become part of the Belt and Road Initiative. But of course, regrettably, the Indians continue to spur this. They just, they're not, seems, seem to be interested in it. Although the Chinese have invested a lot of money in India, something like 70 to 80 billion dollars, the Chinese have invested in various companies in India. And this, of course, has helped India to develop its economy. But uh, unfortunately, now that the Indians think that America is behind them and they would like to be part of the uh, American um, uh, nexus, that they want to take on China. Because the Indians have this um, silly notion that they think that they can rival China. Unfortunately, they cannot. The Chinese okay. economy is uh, many you know, times larger than India's economy. Uh, China is an emerging superpower, and we can also see in terms of this uh, pandemic that um, the Chinese have been able to contain it uh, very successfully. The total number of deaths in China from the pandemic have been under uh, 8,000, whereas India is now the third largest uh, infections, infectious country in the world with more than 1 million infections, and they have more than 26,000 deaths. Although my uh, understanding is that India's deaths, deaths are much more, but because uh, their entire system is so um, inefficient, uh, many people, once the economy was shut down, many people went back into their villages, etc., because uh, they had nothing, they had no livelihood in the major cities. And so India does not count the people that have died in the villages. So we never, re we won't really know the exact death toll, but I think the Indian death toll is much higher than what they have admitted so far to something like 26,500 people dead. But the fact that about a million people have now, they have admitted, the government has admitted that a million, uh, one mil more than a million people have been infected. It has affected uh, India's economy very badly when we consider that there are 400 million people in India that live in absolute poverty. And this was before the pandemic. And so if you add to the fact that as to the ravages of the pandemic and the shutdown of the economy, we can safely uh, assume that twice as many people, in fact, 800 million people or more are now living in absolute poverty in India. So India is in no position to take on China, either militarily or economically. And yet, because it has aligned itself with the US, it thinks that it can undermine China and somehow India can become the regional power, uh, military power over there. Yeah. The, they're making themselves a cat's paw, and it's a dangerous occupation. Um, we're speaking to Zafar Bengaj uh, Crescent, and it seems, you know, Zafar, we have so many hot spots to catch up with here. There's, and I think we should also remind ourselves, this is a quite dangerous situation. India does have nuclear weapons. China has nuclear weapons. And of course, the United States is pulling out of every agreement it ever signed to reduce or control nuclear weapons. And we're seeing very aggressive behavior and, and also events that are hard to understand who the players are. Let me give an example. Libya, 
what I understand uh, President Sisi of Egypt uh, has uh, said now um, he might step in to Libya. And of course, we have President, I guess it is, Erdogan of Turkey, who's completely, deeply involved. Uh, all this is because the United States assassinated uh, Gaddafi and destroyed a, a really healthy Arab country, Libya. So what are these, uh, particularly Erdogan, a NATO member, what is going on there? Yes, well, that's um, uh, you, you raise a number of issues. First of all, let's uh, recap um, for your um, listeners that um, Libya was the most progressive country in the whole of Africa. It is, of course, on the African continent. It's part of Africa, although it's also part of the Arab world. But um, despite the fact that uh, Gaddafi was not democratically elected, but his policies were people friendly. Just to remind your listeners that during his time, uh, education for Libyans was completely free. It was paid for by the government. What, to whatever degree, whatever level the, the, the people want to study, uh, right, all the way up to university, to PhD, to becoming doctors, whatever, all of their fees were paid by the government. Healthcare system was completely free for every Libyan. In fact, any Libyan that wanted to get married, the government would give them $50,000 US dollars to get married, to settle. And Gaddafi wanted to make, um, and of course he invested heavily in the rest of Africa as well, and he wanted to make the African continent become independent of Western dependence. So for instance, he had helped Africa, he launched a satellite for them through the Russian help, so that African countries could communicate directly with each other rather than going through their former colonial master, whether it was uh, France or Britain or Germany or whatever other colonial power it was. Uh, whenever they wanted to, for instance, two countries that are next door to each other, but one was a French colony, the other was a British colony, they couldn't dial directly. One had to go through France and the other had to go to Britain and connect there and the French and the British were making tons of money out of them. So Gaddafi was helping these countries and he was also in fact suggesting that there should be an African monetary fund. So these are some of the plans that he had and that's why the, the Americans and the British and Canadians incidentally, the, the war on Libya was waged, which was the, the, the commander of those forces was a Canadian general. That, that you know, they, they basically uh, uh, led that campaign to destroy Libya, to lynch, um, Gaddafi publicly, and of course that infamous quote from uh, Hillary Clinton that, you know, we came, we saw, and he died. And, you know, this kind of um, uh, imperialist, <laughs> colonialist mindset, yes, that, you know, he, he was publicly lynched, and of course today we have Libya as a failed state. And of course a number of countries are now interfering in Libya. Now let's come to the external players that are present in Libya. You mentioned uh, Turkey's forces and uh, Erdogan, who has sent his forces over there, although he says that he has sent his forces to back the legitimate government that is recognized by the by the United Nations, and then uh, there is that um, renegade general, uh, General Khalifa Haftar, who incidentally is an American citizen as well. <laughs> the Americans are backing him, and he claims to be, and he has you know occupied certain parts of Libya. And he says that he wants to be in power. And he's declared himself the field marshal. And we don't really know. I mean, a field marshal has to have a number of armies under his command. And he has these rag, ragtag bands of militias and he calls himself a field marshal. So it's a royal mess over there. And this is the direct result of Western policies of regime change and of disrupting these uh, countries uh, in different parts of the world. And you mentioned, of course, um, General Sisi who now wants to get involved in Libya as well. Basically what it is, is that Sisi, uh, uh, Egypt's economy under Sisi has nosedived and Egypt is in really bad shape. Now Sisi or Egypt, uh, or Egypt under Sisi is also involved in a dispute with Ethiopia regarding the Renaissance dam that Ethiopia is building on the Nile River. 
Now we need to remember that the Nile River actually part of it originates in Ethiopia and the other part originates in Sudan. And so, of course, one of the strange things about the Nile River is that it's the only river in the world that flows from south to north. Of course, it ends up in the Mediterranean Sea. And the Ethiopians naturally have a legitimate need. They need electricity, they need power. They've been negotiating with the, with the Egyptians for many years, but unfortunately, no agreement has been uh, arrived at. And so the Ethiopians have gone ahead with building that dam. Uh, naturally, you know, the Ethiopians are uh, obliged under international law to not block all of the water from uh, downstream uh, countries, because this is part of international law that no country can block the flow of uh, uh, rivers. Yet, um, for Sisi to divert attention from his failures in Ethiopia and in Egypt itself, uh, he is now threatening to send his forces to Libya, and that would bring him into direct conflict with the Turkish forces over there. And if that were to happen, I think we would have a real mess, and it would be a terrible, terrible situation. And uh, by the way, Sisi is under the thumb of the British and Americans. Uh, Doyen is a member of NATO. You can see that <laughs> there are uh, a lot of um, unpredictable, ugly things could happen here because uh, there are a lot of alliances that people never talk about that would suddenly emerge. Yes, uh, of course. I think, I think we also need to keep in mind that Sisi is... Um, in power by the Americans, the British, and the Israelis. There's also deep links between uh, Sisi's um, military as well as the, the Israeli military. And in fact, um, uh, Sisi is part of this uh, strangulation policy of Gaza, where uh, two million people in Gaza are being starved to death. It is a total siege. So we see that um, in terms of his policies, he knows that he has no support internally, so he has to rely on external backers and get support from them, military support, or at least that they should not um, decide to get rid of him. And yeah. so uh, he's playing along this game on their behalf. But you're right, this, this situation is really terrible. And if uh, a war were to erupt between uh, Egyptian and uh, Turkish forces, I think we would have a very, very messy situation over there. Yeah. Again, we're speaking to Zafar Bengash, and we're very glad that you're giving us this time uh, because uh, we've accumulated a lot of burning issues. Canada and the United States are leading, I would say, Canada's following the United States, of, of the use of sanctions. And we have a situation in Syria and uh, one in the Islamic Republic they seem to me to be particularly ugly. These sanctions, particularly at the time of COVID-19, are particularly dangerous and destructive, and they're not legal. Am I right? And why isn't there more voice here? Why, how is it that, frankly, we get away with uh, committing a crime against uh, the people of Syria and the people of Iran and other countries, actually? Yes, of course. Um, you know, uh, particularly at a time when we have this pandemic that um, the U.S. would um, impose additional sanctions on countries like Syria, Iran, Venezuela, Cuba, um, and a host of others uh, because they do not uh, submit to American demands. The American demands are completely unjustified like, you know, let's take the example of Syria. The U.S. Congress uh, passed uh, a bill which is called Caesar Act. Now, the, the, the act takes its name from a, this is a, Caesar is a fictitious name of supposedly of a Syrian uh, military officer who has been supplying or providing information. Uh, in fact, The Intercept, uh, which is a web a magazine, um, uh, Max Blumenthal is uh, is involved in it. They reported, yes, they reported that um, 
this fictitious character caesar the so called mil syrian military officer actually does not exist this is a myth that the americans have invented this is a cia you know false uh, information campaign because they wanted to target the syrian people and you know uh, us secretary of state uh, pompeo has made no um, secret of the fact that he has said that they they want to uh, punish the syrian government whereas in fact they are punishing the syrian people by by imposing these sanctions on syria because there is uh, definitely uh, it has uh, intensified uh, food shortages in syria and the americans uh, are saying that they want the syrian people to rise and overthrow the government in syria this of course won't happen all it is happening all that is happening is that it has intensified hunger in syria and caesar act is actually meant not so much to achieve any objectives inside syria but to target other countries such as iran or even some of the gulf countries that are now on the verge of uh, restoring diplomatic relations with syria the united arab emirates has already opened its embassy in syria the saudis are also saying they want to open their embassy in syria and the caesar act is actually a warning to them not to do so because the us has still not given up on its regime change policy in syria and of course we can see why the us is so anxious to do that because uh, it wants to protect um or it wants to raise israel as the regional military power and of course you know in in since since this uh, mercenary war that was uh, launched uh, against syria uh, the israeli air force has uh, on a number of occasions bombed syrian targets it has killed people in syria and uh, the us of course is part of that policy of uh, you know imposing additional sanctions yeah. i also want to mention venezuela that has been suffering us sanctions and i'm glad that iran came to its rescue it has sent a number of uh, fuel and food tankers to venezuela and they have defied uh, american naval uh, challenges uh, in uh, in the atlantic ocean and around the caribbean sea and iran has been able to send so far uh, from what i can figure at least six tankers to venezuela and the venezuelan government of course is very grateful for that support because they were virtually on the verge of collapse their oil industry their refineries etc were on the verge of collapse but because of iran's help uh, they have been able to uh, sustain their economy that was a very courageous and principled act the international community should have applauded the 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 rectitude the lawfulness the international solidarity of iran to venezuela uh zafar i realize coming toward the end here that i didn't ask you about something which is a new development apropos of syria and that is that the united states is going after lebanon and lebanon is now beginning to really suffer uh what what are they, are they do they think they're going to accomplish because it, it seems to be part of a, this thing of trying to strangle illegally strangle syria but uh the forces there are um not what they were 20 years ago that's correct uh, in fact lebanon has suffered terribly um the lebanese um pound the also of course lira uh, has declined in value tremendously um, in fact there have been reports and they're not just reports but one can see it on on the internet on facebook and other um, platforms that lebanese are so desperate for food that they have actually been um, putting out um, messages on facebook that they are willing to sell their furniture if somebody could give them bread uh, so lebanon is really being um, badly affected because it's a small country and you the us is deliberately behind this says it not absolutely absolutely in fact the us ambassador in lebanon has been going around uh, you know issuing threats to the syrian government and 
saying that uh, the, the, the sorry the libyan government that uh, you must uh, dissociate yourselves from hezbollah which has members of parliament which are you know hezbollah and its allies have the largest number of elected members in parliament and yet the american ambassador goes around threatening the lebanese government that it should uh, dissociate itself from illegitimate uh, political party and so this is the kind of a parliamentary democracy exactly and this is how america delivers democracy to other countries so here you have a situation where uh, you know a, a legitimately established parliament uh, elected by popular vote and, and and the american government the american ambassador goes around uh, making these uh, ludicrous demands and of course as a consequence of um, american sanctions and american policies that uh, the the lebanese are suffering terribly i also want to add a couple of other points and that is that uh, hezbollah secretary general hassan nasrallah announced last month he said that china has offered to help us to invest in our country in fact chinese have promised to invest something like 40 billion dollars in lebanon to build its infrastructure to build its economy and number 2 Iran has offered to help Lebanon to strengthen its economy and two Iranian oil tankers are anchored outside Lebanese waters and the Lebanese government is unable to allow those tankers oil tankers to come in port because the Americans are threatening them so although both China and Iran are willing to help Lebanon the US is uh, blackmailing Lebanon to not accept any of this help and as a consequence of that the lebanese economy has has been shattered we must bear in mind that lebanon hosts more than a million syrian refugees that have been turned into refugees as a result of the war that was imposed on on syria so we see that the overall game that the americans are playing is to try to destroy lebanon to try to destroy syria economically and uh, to bring the, the, bring them to their knees so that they will accept american demands and follow american policies and and this is uh, we're seeing it this is a kind of a doubling down on a bad bet by the americans they they also have are maintaining troops in syria um it it doesn't appear to me though that the us plan is working um but it's uh, it's like dealing with the devil he always he has a new, a new trick each day can you tell me at lastly i guess because we're using up all your time and i am very i very appreciate um who are these forces that erdoyan's involved with the americans are involved with uh so called i guess are kurdish forces i know that noam chomsky likes them uh in uh Syria that where the Americans have their bases who's how how is that to be solved well, you are right there are kurdish forces as well as there are these other um, isis forces in uh, idlib province and um, basically um, what the americans are doing is that the americans are trying to um continue to supply these uh, isis terrorist forces with weapons with logistical support uh, although some of the people in that region have turned against the americans and in fact there was um, a couple of weeks there was uh, weeks ago there was an incident in which the people came out and they stopped an american convoy from proceeding and it had to turn back and so what the americans are doing is to try to uh, capture or control as many of syria's uh, oil fields as possible so that the syrian government would be denied uh, revenues from these uh, oil fields uh, that's one aspect the other is that erdogan of course um, he uses this um, policy of um, trying to align with whatever forces that he can get in syria regrettably he still has not really reconciled to the fact that his policy has completely failed uh, in syria and that uh, it's time for him to cut his losses and to leave that place um although you know we know that um there has been a uh, an agreement or or a plan 
between Russia, Iran, and Turkey to de-escalate and that the forces over there would be used in such a way that um, uh, the, the forces of these three countries would try to keep the warring factions uh, apart. Um, ultimately, of course, uh, Syria has, uh, the Syrian government has pledged that they want to liberate all of their territory. They will not accept any foreign forces on their land. They will not accept any mercenaries on their territory. And that they, um, they do not want the Americans there because they never uh, asked for the Americans to be there. But regrettably, the Americans are there because we need to understand that for much of America's history, it has been engaged in war. And we know that the American military, industrial, and now, of course, corporate banking sectors are all involved in it. And they know that wars are profitable business. So they want to have perpetual wars. And so long as there is, there is you know, some interference from America in these countries, we, we need to remember that America has at least 900 military bases around the world. Mm. And they're not keeping peace anywhere. They're actually creating trouble for other people. And that applies to Syria. It applies to Iraq. It applies to Lebanon. It applies to Iran. It applies to all of these countries. And that is what is really taking place over there. Yeah. The long, long struggle with imperialism. Zafar Bengay Zafar is director of the Institute of Contemporary Islamic Thought, crescent.icit-digital.org. It's been very enlightening, Zafar. You, you, there are so many things to talk about, and we are so grateful that you have uh, shared your knowledge with us. Thank you very, very much. It's my great pleasure, Phil, and take care. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thanks. Bye-bye.